Amen. Lord, I want to be a Christian. Okay, let's take our Bibles and we'll turn to the book of Judges. Book of Judges, chapter 10. We've been looking at the judges that uh, judged Israel. And uh, last week we saw a very depressing one, and Abimelech. He wasn't actually a judge, he was a rebel, um, the son of a judge. But now we look at chapter 10. Now, Horatio Alger, back in the 1800s, wrote uh, many novels about rags to riches. As anybody from uh, Abraham Lincoln to Joseph in Egypt. Uh, he was quite well. In fact, one of the, the people that uh, Ronald Reagan, as a president, credited with uh, his ambition in life was that he read a lot of Horatio Alger, Rags to Riches books when he was a kid. And uh, this is one of those where we have a reject, a man who came from a sad situation and yet became a national hero. And uh, he was the underdog. And yet, uh, as I titled the message tonight, he was an outcast that outclassed his peers. He was a man that uh, God greatly used, and he is in, act, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 38. He's right up there with, with uh, uh, Barak and Samson and all the rest as far as heroes of the faith. But now we look at chapter 10, and we see that after Abimelech, there arose uh, to save Israel Tola, the son of Pura, and Dodo. Boy, that's a name I'm glad that my parents didn't name me a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shemar, uh, the uh, mountains of Ephraim. So we see that uh, Ephraim is going to have quite a bit of influence throughout the history of the judges, and we'll see it even in this chapter. Uh, he judged Israel 23 years, and he died and was buried in Shamar, or Shimir. And uh, after him arose J- uh, Jair, the Gileadite, so that'd be on the east side of uh, the Jordan. And he judged Israel 22 years, uh, now, he had 30 sons. Uh, that probably means that he probably had more than one wife, you think? So, um, 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. That means he's rich uh, throughout uh, the Old Testament. You'll see the people, including uh, Saul, uh, his fa- father was well off and he, he had his own um, herd. Um, they also had 30 towns, and so these uh, it's interesting, on both sides of, of Jephthah, who later on uh, is not going to have any heirs, we see that uh, the judges before and after him had many heirs. But we see that, um, and he lived in Havilah, or Havath, uh, until uh, Jair, to this day, uh, in the land of Gilead. And, G- and Jair died and was buried with uh, Cammon. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Asherahs and the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of uh, the people of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Now it's interesting, the Lord had given Israel victory over these people, and yet now we see that they go and worship their gods. Later on in the book of Kings, we see the same thing with the kings uh, defeating nations and then assuming, uh, taking their gods as the gods of Israel. And uh, they would even bring their gods back and put them in the temple. And so we see that there's something about these gods that were attractive, something that fleshly drew the people back in. We know a lot of it had to do with immorality. The whole, the lust of the flesh, because these gods really appealed to the baser nature of man. And it it made immorality to be, when you can make immorality into something that is worshipped, or part of the worship service, then you've really hooked your people. And unfortunately, some of the things I'm seeing going on in churches today, and that we're hearing that are so-called churches, I was talking to... um, uh, the Gideons this past week, and they said, you know, Pastor, um, there are certain churches we can't go back to anymore because they've just gone too far outside of the faith. And that's sad, 
but uh, we didn't. He didn't name them, and I, or they didn't name them, and I wasn't asking. But uh, I could. I could tell you two or three of myself that uh, I don't think uh, if you go there, you're going to get into at least immoral, uh, immoral thought, if not immoral ac- actions. I mean, they they have just gone totally into the hedonism of the age. But we see now that uh, these seven, uh, you know, Israel, the Lord gave uh, Israel seven great major victories in the book of Judges, or the book of Joshua. Now we see seven uh, gods that they're worshiping. And they worship the very people that uh, were kicked out of the land. And so the anger of the Lord, in verse 7, was hot upon Israel, and he sold them. I like that again. That's, again, we see several times. The Lord sold them. Okay, if you want to be slaves, I'll sell you. So he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, that would be south, and into the hands of the people of Ammon, that would be over to the southeast. Um, for that year, they harassed and oppressed the people of Israel for 18 years. And all the children of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan, that's uh, in, the land, uh, in the land of the Amorites, uh, in Gilead. Notice the land of the Amorites and Gilead now are meshing. And um, the, uh, that eastern group of people are becoming amalgamated with the foreign people that they had defeated. Moreover, the people of the Am- uh, Ammon um, crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim. So Israel was severely distressed. Now, so we see that uh, the Ammonites were actually distant cousins of the Israelites because you remember that uh, Ammon was one of the sad sons of, of Lot's daughter. So, so the incestuous relationship that he had with his daughters and Moab and Adam, uh, Ammon uh, f- figure prominently in, in these areas, in the, in the history of Israel. And the children of uh, Israel cried out to the Lord and said, we have sinned against you because we have forsaken the Lord. This is first, one of the first times we see that uh, children of Israel now are saying, hey, Lord, help us. So they cried out, uh, and we have served Baal. So they, they admit what they have done. Uh, so the Lord said to the children of Israel, did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the people of Ammon and from the Philistines? Uh, after the Sidonians, and he goes through a list of people. I delivered them from you. What are you doing worshiping them, worshiping their gods? And so, um, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will deliver uh, you no more. Go and cry and out to their gods. So I imagine the Lord had a prophet that came along or a preacher that uh, was saying, you go ahead, you worship them, then uh, get them to do something for you. Uh, Cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in all your distress. And the children of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. So we see, uh, well, I would love for our country to be able to do that. I would love to see a great deal. Now, of course, they will never have all the people do it, but it certainly would be good to see a few politicians, a few uh, people that are in uh, uh, very influential positions, that would cry out to the Lord and say, we have sinned. Uh, do, they, uh, do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us, we pray. So Lord, scourge us, but uh, don't destroy us. So they put away their foreign gods from among them, and they served the Lord, and his soul no longer, uh, and his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Notice how God's heart is tender toward his people. I mean, even though we sin, even though we do all kinds of things that desecrate his name, when we turn back to him and beg for forgiveness, God has a tender heart toward those who do so. Now, it doesn't mean that he pulls us totally out of, uh, or that he just out of nowhere just uh, wipes away all the effects of sin, but he does here, and he starts delivering us from that sin. And we see that's exactly what's going to happen with the children of Israel um, then the people of Ammon gathered together and camped in Gilead. So now, notice they had covered both sides of the Jordan. Both Judah and Ephraim had suffered. 
But now they are camping up north of where their natural uh, country was, and they, were, they had taken over Gilead. Remember, we said that Gilead, that, that eastern side, was really a buffer zone uh, for the rest of Israel. Uh, whenever the people of the east would uh, invade, uh, Gilead had no natural barriers like the Jordan River. And so we see that they came to Gilead, or that would be the tribes of, uh, of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Um, they said, who, is there a man to begin to fight against the people of Ammon? Uh, he, uh, he shall be head over the inhabitants of Israel. Now notice they gathered. It would have been great if they had a prayer meeting, but uh, we see that basically they had a political rally, and they said, we've got to find somebody that will fight for us. And then we see we're introduced to Jephthah in chapter 11. In Jephthah, the Gileadite, that means he was probably from the, the tribe of Gad, we're not sure, was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begat Jephthah. Um, Gilead's wife bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, and they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you have no inheritance in our father's house. Now here you have a situation of immorality. And you have Gilead, who is a prominent man there in uh, that area. And uh, his sons now grow up, and that land belongs to them. But they uh, can be very self-righteous when it comes to, um, to the, um, uh, the inheritance, especially when you're dealing with money and when you're dealing with property. How many of us have seen people who have... Uh, uh, they've turned enemies of one another. They, they get along fine until you put a little bit of money in there or some possession that someone wants and they fight over it. But he was, uh, and those, they accepted him uh, into the home until the inheritance comes along. And now all of a sudden he's the outcast. Uh, and, but that's always been the problem because he was from, uh, you know, he was the son of a harlot. He wasn't uh, from their mother. And so... Uh, Again, we see that they pulled rank on him. And then Jephthah, verse 3, um, fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob, which would have been north Gilead. That'd be on up uh, uh, north of uh, uh, the north part of the country. And worthless men, that word worthless is the idea of not, no, they, were, they were men that really, Kind of like David gathered a lot of the rejects of Israel around him and 400 men followed him. And then they, many of them became mighty men of valor. Well, this is the type of thing also that, uh, that Jephthah did. Worthless men, they, they didn't have a lot of worth to other people. It doesn't mean that they were horrible people, but they were kind of factory rejects themselves. And so worthless men uh, gathered together with Jephthah and went out, and now they raided with him. Now, ra raided? No, they didn't raid their own people, as we see with, jo with David. He raided the Philistines all the time, especially as a teenager, and as he grew up in Saul's court. Uh, and he did it even as he was running from Saul. He still, he wouldn't attack, attack his own people. He attacked the fringes, the, especially with David was the Philistines over here on this side. It would have been the Ammonites and anybody else that was not Israelites there in that area. So he, he had a reputation of being a pretty strong man and of a, a very powerful man in that region. And so in verse 4, then it came to pass after a time that the people of Ammon made war against Israel. Ammon, of course, is down south, but they, they're... Uh, and so it was that when the people of Ammon uh, made war against Israel, that the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. And then they said to Jephthah, come and be our commander that we might fight against the people of Ammon. Now, who else? I mean, it shows you they, they needed leadership at this time. And as someone has said, we get the leadership we deserve, and they had no leadership. So they had to look for a factory reject or a reject for their leadership. So it tells you that these people were very weak people. 
And now they're, they really, I'm sure they felt like they were scraping the bottom of the barrel, but they didn't have anybody brave enough to stand up against the rest of them, except for a man like Jephthah. But now the thing you find out about Jephthah, Jephthah, and I really appreciated this, the more you read the scripture, the more you pick up, you'll never get it all. But I never thought of Jephthah as a godly man. I thought of him kind of as uh, that renegade that made good. But as you read through this passage, you see this man knows the word of God and he fears God. And he, later on, as we said, he was a man of faith and he is included in the, uh, the Hall of Heroes uh, over in the book of, uh, of, um, of Hebrews. We might turn to that in a moment, but uh, we'll see that, uh, that um, Jephthah said to his elders, I like the way he comes back on them, he said, did not you hate me? This is verse 7. He said, did you not hate me and expel me from my father's house? Now, that tells us that this was a kind of a societal issue. It wasn't only his brothers, but everybody else kind of looked at him as, hey, he's the kid of the harlot. And so uh, you can imagine how he grew up with that stain on him. And yet, I imagine he loved his mother. And that's one of the things you see about uh, children. Even though their parents might get... Uh, you know, have problems as far as their scandals and everything else. Uh, I, I read some of these, um, these every once in a while they'll have something on there about some star and they'll talk about the rough background and you read about it and this, uh, this uh, Hollywood star, whatever it had, uh, had, their mother was a star or whatever. And yet, uh, even though their mother ran around with all kinds of guys and they have got uh, two or three different uh, uh, brothers and half brothers and half sisters from different marriages, yet they still love their mother, and of course that's true with uh, most even today. I you see people that uh, ladies who women who can really go off the deep end, and yet there's a natural love for the mother. But uh, he says, uh, "Hey, listen, um, why why have you come to me now when you're in distress? I, I'm taking care of myself. I'm up here, you know, and we, I got my own security. Why do you come to me?" And it's kind of touche. Uh, and the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is, uh, that is why we have turned again to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be our head over the inhabitants of Gilead. So if you will go ahead and, uh, and help us in this area, we'll make you our leader. Boy, that's from rags to riches. So Jephthah did as the elders of Gilead uh, if you make me, uh, if you take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon and the Lord delivers me to you, then I shall be your head. You're going to, hey, you're telling me I'll be the president of the area? That, uh, and the elders said to, uh, to Jephthah, the Lord be our witness if we do not uh, do according to our words. So you do, if you'll be our leader, we'll follow you. And we'll, after that, we'll make you our political leader. Then Jephthah went with the, with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah sp spake all his words before the Lord at Mitzpah. Now Mitzpah, uh, there are several Mitzpahs in, uh, on the map in Israel, but this would be on the east side. Um, you can imagine what this must have, been done, must have been. His brothers were around him. You can imagine what they thought whenever he, now all of a sudden he is head of the family. I, uh, I, I uh, have read uh, Robert Caro's uh, books on uh, Lyndon Johnson. And Johnson was one of those kind of rags to riches type of guy also. But um, he had a girl when he was young that rejected him. And so when he became president, he invited her and her husband to come fly on Air Force One with him. <laughs> he was just that type of guy, you know. And I guess they accepted, but... Uh, you know, it was one of those things, I told you I was going to make it or whatever, but, uh, um, but that's, uh, so you can imagine what happened with his brothers and his family. In verse 12, now Jephthah sent messengers to the king. And now notice what he does here. He's first a diplomat. He realizes that if he raises an army, then he's got, then a lot of the people are going to die. So first of all, he, he tries diplomacy. He's the head of state now. So now he tries to uh, deal with the people of Ammon. Uh, 
and what do you have against us? And uh, then the king, and he said to the king, in verse 12, or verse 13, he said, And the king of the people of Ammon answered uh, the messenger of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt from Arnon and from Jabbok, and from Jordan. Now, therefore, restore those lands peaceably. Oh, boy. Now, what you'll see here is the basic... Now, 3,000 years later, these are the thing, same things, same, same problems. Now, Ammon is saying that, uh, that you took away our land. Now, the Israelites, and he's going to correct them, and he's going to go through the history and say, no, we didn't take away Ammon's lands or nor Moab, Moab, Moab's lands. Now, yes, you roamed all over these lands, but you still have your nation, and we never went through those nations. But God gave us this other land. And so we'll notice four basic things that he says to them that 3,000 years later, they're still fighting over today. And first of all, so Jephthah, again, sent messengers to the king, and he tells them, uh, first of all, he says, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab, uh, nor did he take away the lands of Ammon. For Israel came up from Egypt, and he goes through the history of what Israel did all during that 40 years wandering, and they skirted those two, town, those two areas. Now, they did uh, conquer the Amorites, but not the Ammon, Ammonites. And so he says, yes, we came up around you, and we conquered people around you, but we didn't conquer you, and you still, you're still intact where, in your land. He says, Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the Ammonites. For Israel came from Egypt and walked through the wilderness as far as the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, which was on. And then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom and said, please let us pass by and Edom, the, even the Edomites, the Edomites, the Ammonites, and the Moabites. Uh, those were on the east side of that Red Sea, or the, the Dead Sea. And he says, uh, and, but the king Edom wouldn't let us go through, so in like manner we did with uh, Moab, but he would not consent. And uh, so we remained, Israel remained in Kadesh. And they went along uh, the wilderness and bypassed the land of Edom, and they, in the land of Moab, and came to the east side of Moab. So those tribes, those three cities, or those three tribes, that were on the, um, they were all kin to, uh, to Israel by blood, and yet uh, they skirted those lands. Now, uh, and, he, he, and he tells them about this. And so he knows his history. So this man wasn't a dummy. He, he well knew Israel's history. And then verse 30, uh, 19, then Israel sent messengers to Sion and uh, the Amorites, not the Ammonites, but the Amorites. And these were the people that God had said their iniquity is full. And he sent uh, to the king of Heshbon and he said, please let us pass through. And they wouldn't. And then he gives a history of, yes, so we took care of Sion and Og and all the Amorites. But uh, we helped you out by doing that because they were your enemies too. But we didn't conquer your land. We skirted your land. And so first of all, he knows his history. But secondly, we see that he tells us in verse uh, 23, Now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his, his, uh, the people of Israel. Should they go and possess it? Will you not possess whatever Shemash your God? So if, if uh, your God tells you to possess it, would you? Well, God gave this land to us. And uh, I was, um, I didn't realize it. Uh, but uh, when I was a young, uh, younger man, uh, back in the, well, actually, uh, in my childhood, I remember um, the song that came out, and I didn't know who wrote it. There, were, there was a Jew that wrote it. It was a man named uh, Gold, Ernest Gold, and he wrote it as the theme tune for the movie Exodus, which was written by a Jew by the name of Leon Uris. Leon Uris was a very famous author. I read his book, Battle Cry, as a teenager. It was about World War II and the Marine Corps and so forth. But a uh, uh, very good writer. But he wrote the book Exodus that was turned into a phenomenal movie. But the one thing I didn't know as I was just kind of looking at this was that you know who wrote the words to the tune of that? And some of you older people will, I mean, this will spark you. I had no idea 
that a man named Pat Boone wrote the song, wrote the tune, or wrote the song, the words to the tune. This land is mine. God gave this land to me. This and so forth. That the, the lyrics were written by Pat Boone, whom I've always not really thought of as a great Christian, but that, but he did have influence in in uh, Hollywood at the time. But uh, but you know this God gave this land to me. And so there, that's, the, that's Israel's, that's still their call. God gave us this land. Now, he's going to say, we've had it for 300 years, down in verse 26. He says, uh, he gave us the banks of, from Arnon for these 300 years now. So they've been in the land 300 years. That would be like back at, after uh, the uh, British finally conquered the French and the uh, Dutch. And you remember... Uh, New York was originally uh, called New Amsterdam. It was a Dutch city until the English took it over. And then, of course, French, uh, the French and Indian War and all that. That was all back about uh, roughly, and he's, he's run, uh, kind of, a, if you go through the numbers, he's not exactly at 300 years. It's kind of like me saying 300 years ago. It was really the French and Indian War and when, uh, when the 13 colonies became all British. And so he said, so we've been in the land for, thir- for 300 years. Now the Jew can say from this time here, they can say we've been in this land or God gave us this land 3,000 years ago. And that's what they say. You know, God gave this land to us. Now we have been kicked out or we have been dispersed all over the world. And yet you never really possess the land. It's been laying barren for all this time. It's not really been farmed or whatever. And it's been just kind of a trade route and just a, a but uh, we were the ones who came back and resettled the land. God gave this land to me. And so, uh, first of all, uh, you need to know your history. Secondly, it's that uh, God gave us this land. The third thing is that uh, we've been here 3,000 years now or 300 years. And fourth, and this is uh, the area uh, where he says, um, in verse 27, therefore I will not, uh, we have not sinned against you, but you have wronged me by fighting against me. May the Lord, the judge, render judgment on this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. However, and so he's saying, if you fight against us, then you're fighting against God. In fact, really, folks, you think about it. Our um, people are... Uh, the people that are rising up against Israel, even in the United States today, United States today, are they fighting uh, really the Jew? Or are they fighting God? You t- I don't. Uh, so we see that uh, all the stuff that the, all the. Uh, I'm really fr- frightened of our country today. I mean, we're talking about Columbia uh, University, which uh, we've known has been a hotbed of communism for the last hundred years, or it started back a hundred years ago, and now is coming to seed, uh, in the Ivy League schools, and how can intelligent people, many of them Jews, that, uh, that support something like that? And so who are they fighting against? They're fighting against God. Now, I don't want to get too political here. Now, I know that the Jews have their political problems, and that I understand that, uh, you know, it's not very easy to deal with Jews and, uh, many times, but yet they're God's people. And I said, that's one thing we don't want to do. I could disagree with them very strongly in their politics and their business or whatever, but the last thing I want to do is destroy them. From the river to the sea is diabolical, folks. We are not wanting to exterminate the Jews. And uh, in fact, one reason that God has blessed this country is because we've been a friend to Jews. Irving Berlin uh, God bless America. He, you know, he, when he came from Russia and he saw the freedom that a Jew had here in this country, he wrote that great song. And so we see that, uh, that God has blessed us and, blessed, and really blessed this country through the Jew. Uh, what would have happened if Albert Einstein had stayed in Germany? They would have had to bomb first. And yet he came to the United States. You think of... Uh, Jonas Salk uh, with penicillin and other, just right down the line of the people that God has blessed the world through the Jew and blessed the United States because they were given the freedom to, to be who they were here in this country. 
And so we have to be very careful, and we want to pray for the Jew today. I do not want to see our country and our government turn against the Jew. And how sad it is to see when we're fighting against the Jew, we're fighting God, and we're fighting against God's people. Didn't God say, after all, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee? And like I said, like I want to be like Paul. I want to be oh that I oh that I would give my heart that Israel would be saved. And so we see that yes, they are God's people, and yet they are unsaved people today. And yet uh, there's that that historical connection that God will bless those who bless the Jew. And so, but notice now, well, we'll see with most of the. Of the people, and you'll see it many every time with uh, with Samson. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and this was why they did great things. The spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead to Manasseh, and he passed uh, through Mitzpah um, at Gilead. So uh, here he is on the east side, and through uh, and from Gilead, um, from Mitzpah to Gilead, and he answered, advanced toward the people of Ammonite. Then Jephthah made a vow that he's famous for. It's one of the most heart-wrenching and misunderstood vow in the entire Bible. Now, the Lord tells us not to make vows, but if we do, he expects us to follow him. And whenever you stand, this is one reason that whenever God tells when you stand before God and people and say, I take thee only for myself or for, for the rest of my life, the vow to the, the spouse that you're marrying, uh, it's extremely important. And it's expected to be kept. But uh, he said, if you will have delivered the people of Ammon into my hands, well, let's go on down to verse 32. So Jephthah, uh, well, let's go back to, <laughs> I'm sorry. If, the, if you have indeed delivered the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me. When I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Now, the key word there is the word and. It's it's a little uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. We looked at it back in Psalm 119, where it was uh, in verse uh, forty. Eight. It was um, the, the section, those eight section verses that we saw, it was wa, and it, this was, it was a, a W-A-W. It was a connecting, to, it connected to the, the passage before it, the eight verses before it. But, and it could be used either, either or. And so, uh, and I, I'm really, I think Warren Rouge we hit the nail on the head. Because uh, uh, it's been de- it's been debated, and I told you before that I've had people stop me at the door and argue about it. But um, that word "and" it, so he says, "I will surely give to the Lord, or I will offer it as a burnt off- offering." Now that's still a crazy. Even though if it is "and or," then um, then what is he talking about? Didn't he realize that, what would it have been if it had been his neighbor? What if it had been, uh, you know, a, an unclean animal? He couldn't have offered that to the Lord. What would he do? And so why did he make this vow? So Jephthah advanced toward the people. Now here he was trusting God totally, and then he makes this vow. And it was like a foxhole confession. Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll do this. And so... Um, so Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them. And the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he defeated the, uh, them at Ararite, uh, in Mineth, uh, the twin, uh, in 20, he took as far as 20 cities. And uh, he goes on, um, thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. So he wins the victory. So when Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Now, here he is the outcast. He's got one daughter. And 
this was one. Now he's the, he's the head of the nation. Now he is a landed gentry. Now he gets back at his brothers. Now he has rights to the land. Now he has someone to pass it on to, and it was his only daughter. And she comes out. And now all of a sudden he has no heirs because he has promised the Lord this person. Besides her, he had no other son or daughter, and it came to pass that when he saw her that he tore his clothes like uh, Jews would do back then and, uh, and say, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. Can you imagine? You come out, here he is your dad, and you say, Dad, you've done it. And all of a sudden, well, I didn't want to see you. I can imagine my daughter, you know, what she would have done in that situation. She probably would have hit me. No, I don't know what she would have done, but, you know, uh, oh. So here we see that uh, you know, the, the, the joy and yet now the sorrow, realizing that his daughter is not going to inherit the land. And yet what, do we, what happened here? And so did he kill her? There are several reasons that we don't think he could have. And I think that as I studied, and I've looked all over, but I landed on Warren Rearsby again. Uh, and I, I don't have his book, so I had to look it up on the, uh, on the Internet. And uh, had to, but uh, he gave several reasons why why uh, he could not he could not have killed his daughter. One was that uh, uh, that he would have to go to Shiloh. Where's the only place that you could offer a burnt offering was where at the altar, and the altar was in Shiloh. And Shiloh, of course, the next thing. Do you think a priest would offer a human being? And of course, no. And then, of course, uh, you think of, um, of, of going to Shiloh at this time, especially now that we're going to see that Ephraim is at odds with, uh, with Gilead, that he wouldn't have been able to go there anyway. And probably like, uh, what, like uh, Saul's people, Whenever Jonathan, remember, he won the victory, and he said, uh, whoever eats before we destroy the Philistines, then, um, then you know, let them be put to death. Well, uh, Jonathan, he didn't hear that vow that, uh, or that uh, his father had made, so he was eating honey, and he was coming back, and all of a sudden, Saul was going to kill his own son, and the people stopped him. Well, I think the people would have stopped Jephthah from killing his own daughter. It's, but then the, the, the other thing is that it wasn't her life that was lamented and stressed here. It was the fact that it was her virginity. In other words, she was not married at the time. She is now, you know, she would have, she had, uh, it, now that he was the head, he had the pick of whoever he wanted to give his daughter to, and he could have been very prominent and very wealthy and could have passed that on down through her to him. But there was, an, uh, but we see in Exodus chapter 38 that you could dedicate people to service to the Lord. And we know that's exactly what Hannah did with her son. Lord, if you'll just give me a son, I'll give him to you, and he will serve you all of his life. And of course, he, remember, she gave him up as a, as a young boy to go and serve at the temple, or excuse me, so serve at the tabernacle and serve uh, under the high priest. And so you could do that. And, and so we see that this is, this is uh, in my light now, and the, I just never could bring myself to say that he killed his daughter. But I couldn't figure out how to get out of it as far as people talking about it. But, uh, but the more you think about it, the more that, uh, of course, that was not appropriate, and God was not going to take a blood sacrifice, even no matter what, how foolish you were. But uh, here we see... Notice in verse 36, so she said to him, My father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies. Now here we see it's almost like uh, Abraham and Isaac. Okay, if you've offered me, then I will accept it. And so we see that she is willing to follow. And it tells us something about another thing about uh, Jephthah. He took his vows to God seriously. And so we see that as a godly man. 
And so in verse 37, then she said to her father, let this thing be done to, for me. Uh, let me go along for two months. Just give me two months. Give me about eight weeks with my, with my girlfriends. And we're going to go up and we're just going to have a good time together. If you'll just give me that before you send me down to be a temple uh, servant. He says, and if you wander on the mountains and be, well, my virginity, and I'm never going to have kids. And that was, a one, that was a horrible thing for a young girl to realize back in that time because women that didn't have kids were kind of looked down on. And so, uh, be well, my virginity uh, with my friends and I. So he said, go, and he sent her away those two months, and she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. And notice it didn't bewail her death but her virginity. And so at, uh, at the end of two months, she returned to her father and he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. And notice that she died. Does it say that? No, she knew no man. So in other words, she never got married. Uh, she never had children. And Gideon, or excuse me, or Jephthah never had an heir. Um, and it came to the custom of Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year, and this would have been probably that local tribal area, to lament the daughters of Jephthah, the daughter, uh, the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. So they didn't lament her death. They lamented that now she was going to be a single girl all of her life and that she was dedicated to the Lord. And so notice that they that uh, get it, that Jephthah, I'm sorry, um, is is a very strong man. He you know he swears uh, an oath and he hurt, keeps it to his own hurt, as uh, we see that uh, what the Hebrew or what um, uh, Psalm 15 tells us that uh, a righteous man does. Now there, the story isn't quite over yet. Because those old nasty Ephraimites, the brothers of uh, the people of the of the of the um, uh, of the, Man the people of Manasseh, uh, they always remember with uh, Gideon. They said, "Why didn't you come and help us?" Now Gideon flattered them. He said, "You know, because you know uh, you were such good people, and you came and helped us later on. But uh, you know, at first we had to take care of some things ourselves." But now you came and you really developed, you were really the ones that helped us win the battle. And so, uh, but here we see the Ephraimites come and they do it again. They have not, they have not helped at all, but they want part of the, the victory or part of the, the, of the acclaim. Then the men of Ephraim gathered together and they crossed over the Ziphon and they said that, so they came over, they, they brought, they came over and said, why did you do this? So the Ephraimites were very cocky men. Or cocky, they were a very cocky tribe. And they said, why did you cross over the fight against the people of Ammon and did not call us to go with you? Um, you will burn, we will burn your house down. Man, that's pretty strong. I mean, here you've been made the, area, the uh, head of this whole area here, but we'll, we'll show you and we'll just burn your house down and everything that you have. That's not very nice. <laughs> and so in verse 2, And Jephthah said to them, My people and I were in great struggle with the people of Ammon. And when I called you, you did not deliver. I called people that I had to raise an army. And you said, No dice, guys. We're not going to fight. He said, So when I saw that you would not deliver me, I took my life in my own hands and crossed against the... So I had to, I had to fight on both sides of the Jordan. And I took care of the Ammonites on both sides of the Jordan, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Uh, why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? So, hey, why, you're willing to fight against, the, uh, against me, but you weren't willing to fight against the Amorites. What's wrong with you? Well, I mean, there doesn't seem to be, I mean, why would you rather fight me than the Amorites? And so, and the men of, uh, so we notice that now Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead. Okay, guys, we need to get back together. We got another battle. And they fought against Ephraim. And the men of Gilead defeated Ephraim because they said the, Gile the Gileadites are fugitives and of Ephraim. In other words, they, they were still looking down on that side of the, the river. 
And these people, you know, they stayed on, on this side of the river and, and we're really the, the better people because we're, we're in the promised land. And then the Galenites seized the fords of the Jordan and uh, before the Ephraimites were, arrived. And when the Ephraimites escaped, they did something that is now part of the English language. You can find it in, I think you can still find it. I know I did earlier. Uh, they, they changed the, uh, the um, my, my dictionary is a little old now, but uh, you can find the word shibboleth. And what happened was that these Ephraimites now, as they were struggling, straggling back across the river, then they controlled the fords. And so whenever one of the Ephraimite would show up, he would say, say Shibboleth. And they could not say Shibboleth, they would say Sibboleth. Wrong word, and they would kill him and put him off to the side, wait for the next guy to come by. But uh, the, in all, uh, 45,000 Ephraimites were defeated that day, or that for the, probably take longer than that. And uh, the word shibboleth today, that you'll, uh, every once in a while you'll still hear about someone saying shibboleth, it's the, the idea that if, you're, uh, that if you're, that you don't think like we do and you don't act like we do, that makes you different than us. So it's our shibboleth or whatever. Uh, we believe in baptism, so our shibboleth would be to a Presbyterian that you're not, you know, you don't believe in baptism or whatever. But uh, the whole, so that's the way the word has been used even in English today. But uh, you can imagine, you see the differences in these tribes, and you see it time after time as you look, as you read through the books. Uh, even uh, Peter, later on, by his northern accent, those people, that little girl, that uh, teenage girl knew that he wasn't from, Jer uh, from Jerusalem. And here we see that uh, uh, this guy, the Ephraimites might have had a Boston accent. They couldn't pronounce the word R. I pot my kind. We used to, I, there was a guy named McCarthy in my section in the Navy. We used to love, hey, McCarthy, where did you park your car? I pot my car in the parking lot. You know, we just loved to talk to, and we, he was a great guy. We loved him, and he had a great uh, sense of humor, but we always loved to have him talk with that uh, Boston accent. He could not pronounce R's. Uh, with, as a, as an Englishman, I cannot, and I've told on I cannot, what do they call it, twill your R's, I can't do that, whatever it is, I can't do it. I, so I would never be, you know, you could tell that I am a gringo or whatever, you know, redneck or whatever you want to call me, because I would never make it as far as uh, they would know that I wasn't from that area. Well, this is what happened here. They could not say, they could not say shibboleth. I, down in Mobile, Alabama, uh, there, there's a term called Bayou La Battery. It's down on the coast, but, uh, but it's a fishing village. And many of those people, those bayous, they've been, they've been uh, kind of off to themselves, almost like a different country, all from Louisiana right on, from Texas all the way to North Florida. They got the, that intercoastal waterway and all that. And all of those islands or bayous down there, they've been, uh, uh, they've been secluded for centuries. But um, I think about uh, uh, people that came to our church, and there were a couple of people, and they could not say shrimp. They would say shrimp. And so you knew they were from Bayou La Battery because they could not say shrimp. Can everybody here say shrimp? Is it shrimp? Okay, so you see, so those are the things that uh, happened. So here we see that the Ephraimites from there, they did not develop the SH in their, in their um, vernacular, or let's say, what is it, uh, their uh, okay. dialect, that's the word I was looking for. I mean, we have accents in our country, and that's part of it, but we don't have dialects. Like in England, you have Cockney and all those different dialects, and that's that whole movie that was written by t about um, oh, My Fair Lady. And it was a guy who wanted to prove that he could teach a Cockney person to act like a higher society person simply by changing the way she spoke. And he, and of course, the whole thing of the movie was that he got her to speak right, but at the end, uh, she still was better than the people that spoke the high class language. And so it was one of those things where, yeah, you can change a person's language, but you can't change, change their hearts or whatever.
But uh, here we see that, uh, that they said Shibboleth, and so we see that uh, so they could not pronounce it right. Then he would take them and kill them at the fords of the Jordan, and there fell, fell 42,000 Ephraimites. Boy, that teach them a lesson. And um, so Jephthah judged Israel six more years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died, and he was buried in the cities of Gilead. It was an interesting, God would not allow him to have children because, and I think about how that God worked in our country. The one man that could have been king and could have established himself as king was George Washington. And if he didn't, then he could have, if his sons had grown up, they would have made him king. But George Washington didn't have any kids. Uh, didn't have any, now his wife did by prior marriage. But George Washington didn't have children. Isn't it interesting how that God protected us from the kingdom simply by that one fact. But here, Gil, uh, Jephthah was now the hero. And now he could have really established much better than Abimelech did with, uh, Gil, with his father. He could have probably really passed this on and they could have had a king outside of God's will. But by God's will, we see that Jephthah didn't even really leave an inheritance to anyone. But then it's interesting because we see that uh, uh, Gideon did and had 70 sons. But then we see after Jephthah, there came Elon and he had, um, and he ruled 10 years. Um, well, let's see. And he was buried. And then after him, uh, uh, a guy who had uh, 40 sons and 30 grandsons and all this. And yet they did, we don't see them really conquering anything, but they were just judges, whatever God did to raise them up. But the land had, um, but the land had uh, peace for those years. But all that uh, we see again, God's hand with his people. We see how that God protected his people. He rose, raised up people at the right time, at the right place. And one of the things that shows us that the country was really degraded was they didn't have any leaders. They didn't have anybody who would, they had very weak people. And my, as uh, John F. Kennedy wrote in uh, the book um, that he made, Profiles of Courage, we get the people we deserve. And he gave profiles of courage of a lot of different people that God raised up. That he didn't say God, but uh, that were raised up in our country. Uh, folks, uh, look at our leadership today. We're in a mess, aren't we? But oh, that God can raise up godly men and women that will stand for him. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you, Lord, that in spite of our sin, you love us. And Lord, as we would cry out to you, during, Lord, realizing what sinners we are, we pray that you would raise up godly leaders, men and women who love you, men and women who at least know right from wrong and will will stand on the right. Lord, we realize and we pray as a for our nation. We pray that you'd forgive us for our worshiping of other gods, of putting other gods before you, of putting the God of money or leisure in front of you. Lord, bless your people with godly leaders. We pray even as in this election year that you could somehow, some way, raise up people that will stand and live for you. Bless your people, Lord, with good leadership and protection and with your own divine protection. Lord, we realize without you, we fall apart. So, Lord, how we pray that you would bless us as a country and as a people and as families, and as a church, and as individuals. For we pray in Jesus Christ's precious and wonderful name. Amen.